As the official healthcare provider of Minnesota United, Alina Health is focused on keeping our loons in top condition. And with expertise in orthopedics, sports medicine, heart care, and more, Alina has the team to keep your family in the game too. The experts at Alina Health take the time to get to know you as a whole person, helping you achieve wellness for your mind, body, and spirit. It's an altogether better kind of healthcare. Learn more at alinahealth.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Sound of the Loons presented by Alina Health, episode number 254. And this time I am joined by a very special guest, the new chief soccer officer for Minnesota United, Khalid. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me here today. I know you have an incredibly busy schedule. This is your first appearance of many, I'm sure, on the podcast. You landed in Minnesota a short time ago, jet set it off to Tucson to meet with every single player and staff member. So we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to chat with us. I know everybody listening and watching is going to want the lowdown, the scoop to know everything about what you have going on to get Minnesota United ready for the 2024 season. So thank you for taking the time here today. Welcome to Minnesota. We didn't get to welcome you with the 20 below. I feel like it's really nice. Uh, maybe not what you were expecting when you landed here in the state. Yeah, it was a lot warmer than, than I thought. But uh, first and foremost, thank you for having me. Excited to be on this podcast and also in, in Minnesota, uh, finally. Um, the weather's great. I'm not going to complain. Sweden was minus 20 with a lot of snow. So I'm, I'm used to the uh, four seasons that we have here in Minnesota. Yes, used to the Midwest. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to your time in Milwaukee and, of course, um, your college experience at UWM and how it sort of fostered some of your love for maybe the United States, soccer in this country, but also just the feeling of getting things going here in Minnesota, hitting the ground running. You landed here, went straight to Tucson just about where the guys were in preseason. What has your actual experience been like in the time that you've been here and how excited were you to really get things going? I think really excited. It's obviously uh, not easy with the transition from, you know, Barnsley FC, um, which, you know, need to be said, the owners and everyone's been great to be uh, cooperative to kind of make sure I could leave earlier. Um, but great first day was maybe, I think a week ago, a quick visit to the offices, then jumped on a plane to Tucson, um, you know, meet the players, meet, uh, the staff. And then the last couple of days here in Minnesota to meet the rest of the staff, uh, and, you know, and now get the opportunity to speak to you. Well, and when you, um, started your soccer life, I should say growing up, what was, where did that passion come from? How did you developed this passion for soccer. What was it that made you love this game? Yeah, it's it's, it's clear as day. I think I'll, I'll never forget it. So, uh, you know, my, I'm half Lebanese, half Czech, um, uh, born and lived in Lebanon from essentially from I was born till I was nine. Um, War torn country. You know, it was a tough, tough upbringing. I remember uh, one day my dad says, hey, come on, sit down. And it's the 1986 World Cup. Right? So I'm born in uh, 1981, mm-hmm. so I was five years old. Mm-hmm. I see this, you know, number 10 running around, of course, you know, Diego Maradona. Mm-hmm. And I just tell my dad, that's what I'm going to be. Um, the next day he bought me like a plastic ball. And I think since then uh, it was both a personal escape from all the trauma and the difficulties I had in, in Lebanon. Then when we fled, uh, football essentially kind of made sure I integrated really well. Um, and I call it like, you know, love of my life along with my wife and my children. <laughs> uh, but it's meant everything for me. And for me, it's not just a sport. It's a social movement because I've experienced the power of it myself. Uh, and then he just, you know, helped me integrate, learn Swedish, get friends, gave me a career, education, brought me to the U.S. Um, now it's, it's 
part of my DNA. Well, and people always say, you know, even with Minnesota United or any club in the United States with Major League Soccer, or even in college, you have all these people speaking all these different languages and people are like, how, how does that work? But you you basically just defined it. It's it's the sport that really allows you to communicate with others. It's the actual game itself where then the language come late, comes later, but you can play with just about anybody. You toss a ball out there and it's a good way to kind of integrate into different cultures and meet different people. So that must have been part of, as you said, your love for this game and bringing people together. Yeah, and, and you know, and it continues. Like I had stories when I was in, uh, you know, Sierra Leone, Freetown on a scouting trip all by myself. And then I see someone with a Man City jersey. Straight away, I walk up to him and say, oh, you know, Man City. And you connect, create friends. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing, you know, it breaks walls and barriers. Um, and I think that's the power of, of the sport that we need to, you know, make sure that we honor and, and continue to develop the next generation. So you talk about a little bit of your upbringing and the experience of soccer and moving. When you decided to pursue college soccer, well, how did that come about? Because oftentimes people in other countries or over in Europe or different places, they, they don't even think about college soccer. They're thinking about just pursuing it at a professional level, joining some sort of academy and pursuing it that way. What made you want to join and be a part of college soccer and in the United States? I think uh, credit probably to my parents. Um, I wasn't really thinking about college. I was, you know, about to finish gymnasium, which is equivalent to high school. I was, uh, you know, somewhat of a talented footballer. I played for the serious first team. I broke into it, played a lot of games, and I was quite set on, you know, I'm staying in Europe. Uh, but I was always quite injury prone. Whenever I felt the best, I got injured. Uh, and my father and my parents said, education is super important. Education is super important. So I try to find, you know, like a happy balance medium. And so my dad who then said, hey, you know, I have friends who went to college. My father was in college. He left Lebanon to Czech Republic. That's where he met my mom. Um, so, you know, I'm half Czech, half Lebanese. Um, so I, I will never forget. I was like, okay, I guess I'll look into it. Uh, so I was online having no understanding of the college system of whether D1, NIL, like, no understanding. And I just started scrolling around, uh, clicked Santa Barbara, New Mexico, um, got a response, you know, and a little bit of uh, contact that way. Uh, and then I got onto this website and UWM. And I read Louis Bennett's profile. I looked at like the colors. I liked black and uh, yellow at that time because I liked Boston Bruins. <laughs> um, so there's all these kind of non-explainable connections mm -hmm. uh, it's a panther panthers are my favorite yeah, animal yeah. they were puma puma it used to be it's adidas yeah, now yeah, yeah. that was my favorite mm -hmm. uh, brand so i just sent an email and i and then i set out that i was going to send an email to these programs x amount of time to see what type of reaction and one day i just got an email that says i am gonna be in sweden Bennett, who showed up um an amazing man today still you know one of my absolute best friends and mentors he told me how milwaukee has great beaches and great <laughs> weather and you know he, he played that whole spiel yeah, yes um it's actually i you know i, I when i won this uh, in my senior year the herman kluge award mm -hmm. for a student athlete mm -hmm. of the year i keep making fun of Louis. i'm like you promised this beautiful and None of it was true. Right. Uh, but what it was, amazing culture, great yeah. people, great program. Uh, so that's ultimately how I ended up. I had a loop of faith. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best decisions I've made in my life. So when you came over here and visited Milwaukee, from, were you in Sweden at the time? Yeah, so I was in Sweden. So this is 2000, turned 19. That summer was probably one of my best football summers. Yeah. I'm still not really sure uh, by then. I never visited Milwaukee. I okay, just, so I you came. Left got it. So you came for preseason. 
You landed for preseason of UWM. Mm -hmm. Louis Bennett was the head coach at the mm -hmm. time. There's a long lineage in the state of Minnesota, uh, including with Minnesota United, of, of people that have gone to Milwaukee, including, as we talk about, Manny Lagos and Tony Sana. So, you know, legends of the game here in the state of Minnesota. So you land in Milwaukee. What were your first impressions? Was Were your parents with you? Did you come on your own? How did that, you know... You land, you're expecting this beach, maybe not the same kind of beach Definitely you were thinking. Not. How did that go when you first came about and what was your expectation? Um, I had no idea what I was you know, gonna kind of put myself into, but that kind of summarized who I am as a person um, in terms of you know, risk versus reward. I, I like calculated risks. Mm -hmm. um, showed up at O'Hare, was picked up. I think it was by Scott Dombrowski. Mm -hmm. um, which that whole Dombrowski family is amazing yeah. with lineage uh -huh. of a lot of players. Uh -huh. um, I can tell you that within a month I wanted to go home. Really? Yeah, I did, it was not what I expected mm -hmm. at all, whether it was the kind of the facilities or, you know, the initial environment, the freshman initiation party. I, I came thinking from a professional perspective, yeah. I'm going to UWM to win a title. Yeah. I didn't go there to thinking I'm on a party and mm -hmm. do all these things. Uh, so that was a bit of a culture shock. Mm -hmm. um, then I became redshirt because of academic. Well, Michigan at that time was more strict, so they, they, would, they wouldn't uh, transfer. Like your credits. Oh, okay. Yeah, they Got wouldn't it. transfer some, some of my um, uh, grades from Sweden. Mm -hmm. So first year redshirt. And I remember then I just the bone in my shoulder not a very good freshman year and i remember going into louis office and saying look i'm leaving mm -hmm. and he just told me please stay one year trust me and it was him stan anderson and john mm -hmm. coleman stay give us one year um and i gave it a year a year turned out to be nine years and then um, you and it changed you know i and louis gave he's like if you think something needs to be changed go ahead and do it started with this you know we still call ourselves magnificent seven the, the guys that showed up at Wembley uh, mm -hmm. early morning trainings and just slowly slowly but surely created a culture that you either in mm -hmm. or you're not part of it mm -hmm. um, and I was fortunate enough to have some great teammates and then that are still friends today uh, that kind of bought into that we could actually win a title and I think if you look the following years between 2000 to 2005, you know, some of the best years of UWM. Credited to everybody, uh, but I was happy to be part of it uh, in terms of just changing the mindset. So when you came in, you registered the first year. How do you, as a young player, sort of establish that? Because I feel like a lot of what you're talking about here is going to correspond to your entire career, your entire life, and of course your time here at Minnesota United and what you're trying to do with the group here. So how do you how do you do that as a young player coming in and sort of trying to set the tone in the culture? I think it's uh, building a narrative of explaining why we're doing this. And if we do this, we'll get better and ultimately we will win. Um, and I had this group that bought in. First we were seven, then we were 30 dozen, 12, and then essentially the whole team was part of it. And I think if you would even you know, speak to Steve Bowie, coach of Loyola, who was there after I left, that tr culture and tradition continued. And it was ultimately just blocking all, all noise mm -hmm. and being kind but ruthless at the same time, giving everyone the opportunity to join and be part, but also having such high demands that this is the way we need to go if we want to be successful. I um, did read that your nickname at UWM, and correct this is, I mean, it was, it was the UWM website, so who knows if it's accurate? It might have been all the way from 2004, but it, your nickname was the coach. Would that translate correctly? That that's how you were on the field, in the locker room, with the guys, and then it clearly has translated after. But I also didn't read that you wanted to be a coach necessarily once you graduated because you majored in, was it international studies? Uh, MBA in business and then a uh, uh, bachelor's degree in, in marketing and in International business. And so this nickname of the coach, where did it come from? Basically just what you probably talked about. But did you play midfield? Did you play center back? I feel like I've read a little bit of both, which is kind of the conductor uh, on the yeah. pitch. Uh, center back. Um, 
I didn't even know that I, they call me coach on the website. I need to go <laughs> back and look into it. I think it was, I questioned things mm -hmm. um, in a way that I just wanted us to continue to be better. It wasn't that I, you know, I tried in any way be arrogant. I always listened to Louis and I think, you know, always try to have the highest, highest possible standards. But I knew that we have to do, as, do it as a collective to even be able to compete to powerhouses like Indiana, Notre Dame, and, and Creighton, et cetera. So it'll be the same, same here. It's, you know, we're all going to have to be doing this together if we want to uh, overachieve or, or get, get that title. Um, so I think it was probably more towards wanting everyone to be on board. Yes, probably at times sharing my opinion of what I think is right or wrong. Um, yeah, but maybe as a center back, you also get that a little bit. That you have a different overview or holistic approach to it. But you also probably learned in, in your lifetime, right, of these different roles that you've had because you've been and done just about everything for sure yeah. in the soccer world, right? Yeah that you, you can have a, a good mindset of questioning and um, bringing ideas, and, but you also have to be, have someone who is receptive to those ideas, who's willing to listen to those ideas. doesn't mean your, your idea will be taken, but having an environment where everybody feels like they can bring their ideas, they can bring their thoughts and opinions, maybe they have a better way or a different way of doing something, but you have to have someone in charge in at the helm that accepts those ideas and is willing to listen to those ideas have you also found that along along your journey yeah 100 percent. i mean even now initially when i you know i i asked my colleagues you know what do you think this is my vision but i want to hear what you, you what you have to say you know your experience is different than mine and just because i did something in barnsley or part of city football group or you got in all but that does not mean it's the right thing for Minnesota because each club and organization is its own living organism. I have an idea of where I want to go, but I'm happy to bring input because I think we always have to evolve. If you don't change or evolve, ultimately people will just run past you. Um, and I've had that kind of mindset of curiosity and collaboration already when I was little. Like I, I had two goals. One, either I was going to be playing at the highest level I was going to work at the highest level. It was going to be in football. Um, so there was always an idea and a strategy behind all these roles or everything essentially led me to where I am today. Um, and I think when I now sit in this role is why I also am comfortable being collaborative. I know what a video analyst does. I've been one. Mm -hmm. uh, kit manager, done mm -hmm. that, like done all of it. Um, so I think it helps me connect, connect with people. <laughs>
be professional, not just best at what you do, but curious enough to improve yourself, but also look of how you can improve the club. Right, uh, uh, Mitch, who's now a new uh, director of kit, has great ideas of how we can evolve the club. Like, why would I not listen to him? Because he sees something I don't see. Um, positive, look, I've had a rough life. I know what, you know, sacrifice or um, negativity is but I don't allow someone say Minnesota United are cheap. We're not cheap, we're efficient. Uh, you know, it's not cold here. We love the four seasons. Um, th the whole mentality of just continuously thinking that the glass is, I think it's half full right now. Mm -hmm. half full That's the positive side, yeah, yes, so <laughs> not half the empty. Positive, <laughs> yeah. That it's half full mm -hmm. because you want to talk sacrifice, I'll tell you about war and mm -hmm. cousins dying and us fleeing Lebanon and refugee camps and life can be tough anyway. So why bring that to work? Mm -hmm. um, and last one is honesty. Uh, and if you can be honest in the toughest decision situations, because winning is easy once you start yes. winning. It's when you lose 12, 13 games in the row where I want to look around, whether it's you or everyone around here is, do you have my back? Because mm -hmm. I'll have yours. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those experiences kind of strengthened that foundation for me. And if our culture at Minnesota United has that, sky's the limit. Because there's so many variables you cannot control. You know, I thought Barnsley FC were by far the team that should have won last year in Wembley. We lost in the 120th minute. I can't control that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so good people and then clarity in what you want and get everyone on board and every person is as important as the other. When you look at your different roles, and I just want to go down the list sure. a little bit, at Barnsley, you know, you were the CEO and sporting director, you were hired in 2021, but it said that you were immediately charged with enhancing the overall management, recruiting, academy, and commercial operations. What did that mean to you when you, when you took that job? What does that job description entail? I mean, it kind of sounds like you're going to have your hands in just I about did. everything when you got to that club. What, was, what did that mean to you when you took a hold of it? Like, again, I, I, so that's the broader kind of description. But right. when I walked in, I said, and I've done the same thing here. First thing I thought, people. So I met every person from laundry lady to CFO. And if you get those people on board uh, and i was fortunate enough that i had great colleagues you can then start delegating and the ultimate goal was to leave barnsley in what i thought is in a better place than i found it which i would hope that it is um and it's kind of the same strategy so i didn't get overwhelmed by this grand scheme of the role but i started at the bottom connect with people first start delegating while always knowing where we're heading and then slowly communicate that as you go along uh, and as you get the people with you the power of the group is amazing uh, you know we faced relegation we made that happen we had a great colleague of mine that had a stroke we had to adjust a uh, day before a game a clattering of a stadium fell down. We had to shut down a whole stand, relocate 5,000 fans. Everyone did it in less than 24 hours. Like that's the power of teamwork. Um, and it goes back to, to people. So even now coming as a chief football officer or soccer officer, I look at it from the same way. It's great. The title is great. I know where we're going as a vision. Uh, but first and foremost, people. So I've interviewed every staff member, every player, um, in the first week that I've been here, uh, because there's inside information, data points that, you know, can help me guide us to move to where we want. And ultimately it's hope, hopefully to win a championship. What intrigued you about this opportunity? Why Minnesota United? Why major league soccer? I know you were part of, you know, city group that was with New York city, NYCFC. And of course they won MLS cup in 2021, but what is it about Minnesota United at this moment in your career in Major League Soccer that made you want to be a part of this? So this decision, it's, it's, it's like in boxes. Box one, I look at the league. One of the fastest growing leagues in the world. Check, want to be part of it. Two, you look at like the geographical 
um, what's happening geographically. You have Copa America, Gold Cup, potentially Club World Cup. You have the Men's World Cup. You have the Olympics, potentially Women's Women's World Cup. You have so like you have defining moments for the region in the next coming five years. I want to be part of that, both to experience it, but maybe it's somewhere I can influence from my experience at least at least be part of that journey leading up to I think when the CBA expires twenty twenty seven. You have the Apple deal, which I think is interesting take on where TV might be going. Um, so I found that fascinating. Then I looked at like my personal development. What do I want to do? And, and being in England is great, but I had experienced it. Do you want to be in League One, a championship, not too big of a difference um, in the sense of kind of the environment. Um, so I wanted to do, again, something different, kind of like when I came here in 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that's probably going to develop me as a person. Um, then it's a family aspect of it. They had just learned English. Uh, so this opportunity to come here to balance off the English And they accent. is, they are. My wife, Fianik, which is essentially the most important person in all of this. And then my two lovely daughters, Ella is seven and Livia is four. Uh, hence, everyone comments on, on my bracelets. On the bracelets, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, I do have to give credit. Sherry is amazing. Um, her energy and kind of vision of where this club is going, it resonated with me on a personal level, but also from a prof- professional level. Then I looked, I like the ownership. It's local, co- mm-hmm. essentially connected to the club and the community. Then look at your fans, great fan mm-hmm. following, great stadium. And there's so many boxes that kind of check, check, check. Um, all good to help me in the final decision of where I thought this is where I think I can come and win. Because all this is great, but I didn't come here to you know just high five people and think this is a great environment. I did come where I also thought we had the ability to compete and hopefully bring a title um and you know i new york won the title in 2021 um city treated me amazingly david lee sent me the jersey they brought a trophy to manchester they invited me to the training to uh, the etihad um, um campus to take a picture with the trophies amazing however i was not on the pitch when they won it and i want to make sure i i uh, uh, give myself a chance and everyone here to hopefully lift the trophy. That's the icing on the cake. Because you knew you were exactly. part of the puzzle that put it together. 100%. But there's something about celebrating that moment together on the field and yeah. being a part of it. So you felt like this was something. Minnesota United was something that um, after it checked all those other boxes, family, life, journey, league, what the you know the North America is doing in soccer right now, this felt like a good step challenge next thing for you in your professional personal life so what is it once you've actually been able to dive into it what's your overall picture of it so far where this club is at and you know we all know they missed the playoffs minnesota united did last season they finished 11th in the western conference this club, this state, these people, these fans, these players have high expectations and aspirations, not just to make the postseason, but to go beyond that. When you got on the ground, what was sort of your view of it? I know you were doing all your due diligence before you even arrived, but what was your thought? I think that Minnesota United, um, since they came into the league, has done a great job and looked at it from a holistic approach, right? Do we want a beautiful stadium? We have a beautiful stadium. It's a competitive squad. Uh, so it's not like a complete, you know, rip it all up and clean it up and start over. It's essentially an evolution. Um, look at what's been done in the past that's good and how we can kind of evolve it together to move forward. The expectations of winning is is always there in sports, whether you're the best team or the worst team in any league you want to win every game. And I think that mindset is what we need to have on and off the pitch. You know, kind of a bit cliche, but the pursuit of excellence. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't want to be better, if we don't want to have the best podcast, why are we having a podcast? Mm -hmm. Um, And I want everyone to feel empowered and accountable for that journey. 
And if we all do that, then I think the resources are here uh, to be very, very competitive. But I also do know you can be the best team and yet never win a title. So that kind of winning cannot just be the trophy that's icing on the cake. You summarized it pretty well. But the mindset for all of us from owners to, you know, smallest role should always be that we want to uh, win. Um, and the initial reaction is good people, uh, professional, and, you know, I do feel that hunger to bring a title because Minnesota have been, been close a couple of times in the past. I want to go to Sherry's quote after, um, I, I don't remember if this was actually in the um, press release or this was an article I read, but when she interviewed you, she said, tremendous background, track re record of success, exceptional technical vision, a leadership approach that matches our club's values and beliefs and energy and focus about him that I personally loved. And that was one of Sherry Ballard's quotes about you. We've talked a bit about the values, the beliefs, you're clearly people oriented. What about the technical vision? What is that when you look at, not necessarily just this club, because you got to you know work with what you got on the roster, right? You, and it's quality roster. But what is your technical vision for this team, for this style? What's your philosophy when it comes to soccer itself? Um, I've learned that not one style is good for all. I think you have to, it's part of like a deeper understanding of the community right? Uh, the fans, the weather, the city, like what is our competitive edge? Um, you know, are we going to be possession based football or more high intensity? Uh, so I've looked at all that, uh, you know, I can take it all the way to when the players walk out, they put their hand on the yeah. iron stone, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, that's that resonates to hard work and intensity. Um, so I have a pretty clear idea of where we're going. And I will discuss it a little bit more in detail at the future date because I think it's important. I'd like to keep it in house um, as I, you know, speak with the coaches and staff about it. But in general, uh, I w of course, you know, a lot of people say it. We were going to be competitive. We are going to be brave. We are going to be looking to press much higher. Um, we are going to. You know, we will get younger. We are going to play more younger players. Barnsley, one of the youngest teams in England. Uh, NYCFC, one of the younger teams in MLS. Uh, there will be a bit of shift in that. Um, but ultimately, I want us to be, you know, as competitive as we can. So every game we go into, we give ourselves the best chance to win. So if you're looking at this current roster right now, and I know even in Tucson, there's been a lot of academy players, a lot of twos, a lot of players that have been involved with the first team preseason, and I'm sure they'll continue to as well. You just said this team's going to get younger. So that point of emphasis, and you and I were talking a little bit about it before we, we started recording, is you don't know what someone's capable of if they're not given the opportunity. Is that part of your philosophy as well with – and I know that a lot of it is going to depend on the head coach and, and the conversation there. But to the point about anybody in any role in life, you don't know what someone's capable of if they're not given the opportunity, but also given the confidence in that opportunity to go out and, and do what they're capable of. Yeah. So I think it starts with having a clear pathway and collaboration from first team all the way down. That's something we've already started working on. We're going to speak the same language from top to bottom, same data points, same physical training. All of it has to align. So we know when that young players come into the first team environment, it's, you know, he is well prepared for it. They have to earn it. Nothing is given because it's still a high performance environment. Um, but I think giving them up, uh, giving them the opportunity is something we have to be part of because we, we want, we don't know if Randall, a uh, 16 year old is good enough or not, or Cage or Louis or some of the young talented players that, that we have here. Um, so I, I do believe it's important and we will create an, imp an, an environment that gives uh, younger players the opportunity. That being said, part of that environment, players like Box, Soul and Trap are as important as the young one. Um, and I think, you know, it was, it was a quote I heard once is, if you cannot play one 16 year old, you have a bigger issue than that because then your other 10 players are not strong enough to carry one player. Mm -hmm. um, so I sometimes kind of kept that in my mind that if I have a good squad, we should be able, you know, to, to give an opportunity to uh, 
uh, someone someone young. When you look at what this team has been able to do during the offseason and some of the uncertainty, and I know I've done a, a podcast with Will Trapp already, and he talked about some of these young players that have been in every day, 7 o'clock in the morning throughout the offseason, day after Christmas, day after New Year's, very committed, you know, wanting to be a part of whatever it is that was going forward. When you look at what this club has done and how they've sort of focused their energy during the offseason without a head coach at this point, what does that say to you about the group that is here? And I know you were down in Tucson and had meetings with everyone because Robin had to scoot from our last podcast to make sure he got to your meeting on time. Mm -hmm. What have you gleaned from this group, um, whether it's the staff or the players, and sort of how since since you've arrived and what they've sort of been doing during this time? Look, I I said it even in my individual meetings with the players and the staff. Like it's a great compliment, uh, the fact that with all this you know uncertainty. Uh, it's a compliment to the way the ownerships handle it, to Sherry, uh, all the way to every staff member every day. Because when I walked into Tucson, you could feel the energy. Cam has done a great job, uh, you know, uniting everybody. And the players have been great, showing character and unity and kind of focusing on what they can control. And that shows strength. Um, and, and that was exciting to see. Because, again, I, I don't think it's massive changes it's it's an evolution um and they bought in early into it uh, and they should you know all be complimented of how they've handled themselves in this initial period we also have seen and you probably know this from your time all over the world in soccer but preseason is a very important time right to set the culture the tone these guys are away from their families they're really kind of hunkered down in a hotel they're spending a lot of time together so you get that bonding that time together and setting sort of a style of philosophy going into the same, you know, the next season with the same head coach or with a different head coach, it doesn't really matter. So when you look at this group and going into what remains of the preseason and heading into 2024, what are some of the boxes that you're looking to check or what are some of the things that you're looking for in a head coach as you continue the process, depending on where you're at with it? Yes, I think it's important that whoever, you know, joins the club is collaborative, open to the Minnesota United way it's you know it's not one person more important than the others uh, we have to all buy into there's certain things that the coach needs to understand we want to play younger players there is a discussion around the style so do we do use you know um, some data in certain aspects to see if there's an alignment of how we want to play and what that coach can deliver uh, but ultimately it comes down to the person like who we bring needs to be a good person uh, there's good people here. And I also don't think it's about, you know, the head coach is the answer for everything. Mm -hmm. Because you can have a very good head coach, but an unbalanced squad. Or you can have a very good squad and a good head coach, but bad physical department or bad sports science. It, it all comes together. So I think the person who will join us um, just needs to fit into this, you know, new collaborative way that, that we want. Um, so... I think it's it's an ongoing process. I'm quite confident. I'm confident in in where we are, um, and at the right time, you know, that decision will be made. Uh, but like I said to you earlier, sometimes uncertainty can be a great way for others to step up. Right? There's if there's no new head coach, how does Cam handle it? It's a great experience for him to if he is, aspires at one day to be head coach. He is ultimately the head coach right now. Um, whether it's then in this or science or physical, there's, you know, directive performance. Well, Casey and Bell, show me what you have. Like, it's an opportunity, almost like an acad uh, acad academy player gets a chance. Take it. Always, you know, I listen to Eminem and like, you got one shot, you're going to take it. And I think that resonates for everybody right now. So when you look at, you know, moving forward and Cameron Knowles has been fantastic. I mean, we've done podcasts with him several times when he was the head coach of MNUFC two and, stepping in and taking on this role as well. I think there's a there's a continuity that piece there for him and for the players as well, just knowing the understanding he was on the bench for the end of last season with the first team and the young players. Do you think you're going to get a a sense of a knowledge and um, continuity with that, with the young players from the twos that he's been coaching and throughout the academies to then continue to integrate into the first team in this interim 
yeah. timeline. Yeah, and him and the staff and uh, Jeremy and Adi and everyone around done a good job. Like you said, was, you know, several academy players, uh, part of the preseason and not just training, actually contributed in the games. Uh, that continuity is, is always good if it's high level. Mm -hmm. And so far they've, they've been, you know, they've been very good. You mentioned the fan base earlier when we were talking about different boxes that were being ticked as far as the, the, the fabulous stadium, fan base, ownership group, all of those things, history of soccer in this state. What would you say to this fan base who is clamoring for the next decision? You know, they were once the decision was made last year for Adrian Heath to no longer be with this club and Sean McCauley took over and now it's Cameron Knowles and you were hired in November and you've arrived and people are waiting for a head coach. What would you say to this fan base that just has never faltered, never wavered, sold out stadium every single match, Amazing. regardless of yeah. the situation? Yeah. Um, there isn't an, an atmosphere like it. What would you say to this this fan base that's going to listen to this? To continue be who they are, you know, curious, have high expectations, support the club. Uh, you know, everything happens for a reason, and there there is thought behind every decision. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm confident and excited of where the club is is heading. Um, and one of the reasons I'm confident and excited is because of the fan base. Um, so I think, you know, just get ready and be excited for the coming games. Uh, whoever's on the bench or not, um, always get, get behind the club and, and things will fall in place. And just lastly, when you look at um, your time here, I know it's been brief. I mean, you and I were even talking before we came in here about places to live, what to do, your family's going to be joining you, and just the importance of culture, not just within the club, but within the community. What is the number one priority for you in this community, connecting this club to the community? Because I know that was another high thing on, on Sherry's list. That's always been something that's been important to her since she took over is the community and the club aspect and the togetherness of it and bringing everybody together. How do you plan to connect this club to the community or continue to? Uh, so we've already had this co uh, conversations of how we can give back in terms of knowledge and con uh, connect with the local clubs, um, looking at how we can involve the players more in community work, um, how I can be you know, open for it. Uh, do we have more open training sessions? Like I said, for me, a football club is uh, essentially like a social movement and a living organism. Uh, and we need to embrace everybody and we need to reach out to the community. Um, and I think Sherry and everyone here is doing a good job. And hopefully we can do more and more and more uh, along with, you know, our great partners um, that, that the club has. Um, so now I'm excited to see where we're going to be in the next day, week, month. Years. It's crazy to think that opening day, like the, the season starts in a matter of weeks. It's, yeah. it's, it, it doesn't even feel like it outside because it's so warm. I'm, we were talking about earlier, the guys I'm sure wish they were out on the grass rather than in the bubble still, but um, it's going to be here before we know it. Uh, the season starts, I believe, February 24th. Yeah. Well, technically February 21st. I know there's one game, but um, February 24th for Minnesota United and then a home opener, I believe it's March 2nd, against the MLS Cup champions, Columbus Crew. So it should be a great one um, here at Allianz Field. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak thank with you. me today. I'm sure people are going to be clamoring to listen to this, to hear from you. I don't even know if you've done any media availability yet because you've been jet-setting around trying to get your ducks in a row with the, the important task at hand of this club. So thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody, stay tuned. Another episode of Sound of the Loons next week presented by Alina Health. Appreciate you tuning in today and we'll see you next week.